So I'm Laura Forlano. I'm an associate professor here at the Institute of Design. Um, and I'm really delighted to be joined um, by Nassim Jafari Naimi, who's an assistant professor at the digital media program at Georgia Tech. Um, Andrew Schock, who's a postdoctoral um, fellow at Chapman University. Um, Carl DeSalvo, who's an associate professor also in the digital media program at Georgia Tech, and Chris Ledantic, who's also an associate professor um, at, in the digital media program at Georgia Tech. And um, this is a really exciting opportunity for us to have this conversation, really thinking about the ways in which um, the future of cities might mediate between top-down and bottom-up approaches, how might designers and citizens understand these opportunities or redirect these initiatives and what kind of design approaches are most relevant to engaging with these uh, political, economic, and social transformations. So we'll offer um, a set of uh, conversations um, to prompt your thinking, and then we'll open up the floor to question and have more of a, a dialogue. Um, so with that, I would like to um, invite Nassim Jafar Naimi to uh, give uh, her take on Smart City. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you so much for your generous invitation. It's very exciting to be part of this panel and to participate in this conversation. Uh, for my uh, contribution to the discussion, um, I would like to put forward the idea that part of uh, the task of design in relationship to uh, smart cities is to um, help us rethink dominant imagery, framing, and values of smart cities. And uh, as an example of what that might mean, I'd like to invite you to think about uh, self-driving cars uh, that are part of the technology that have drawn a lot of uh, in attention and interest uh, from both scholars and the public um, about the future of uh, cities. Uh, and although the tragic events of a couple of weeks ago uh, have um, made some people pause and think about uh, whether and how these machines might operate in the city, uh, I'd like to invite you to think about uh, this article that came out in late 2015 uh, called Why Self-Driving Cars Must Be Programmed to Kill. It was uh, distributed widely, it drew a lot of attention, and arguably it set the terms of discourse about what this technology is. The argument that was put forward in this, ar in this article was as simple and flat as the image that you see um, accompanying it. It was this idea that uh, self-driving cars, uh, that you know, a lot of accidents, this, there was this sense of urgency that a lot of accidents happen every year due to human error. Uh, self-driving cars can potentially eliminate that human error, but they can't, uh, they, are, they can't eliminate all the accidents. There are occasions where they get into these uh, situations where accidents are inevitable, and so we need to, be, to program them to kill. And so uh, I will not get into the details of uh, you know, the, all the logical fallacies of that simple three-step argument, um, what I'd like to draw your attention to, though, is how we go from this high-level question and problem of mobility um, that can have a myriad of um, solutions and responses to it that have to do with policy, with infrastructure, with, how, um, with public transportation, and we move then quickly to what's the best kill decision, which is what serves uh, the interests of big tech companies. Uh, and similarly, in these images, what happens is that you know, the devastation and pain that's associated with fatal accidents is removed in these caricatures uh, that uh, you know, uh, depict these, uh, this kind of utilitarian ethics. Um, so what happens if we replace those images with actual images of ac accidents and um, how um, devastating they are? What happens if we replace the term self-driving uh, cars with uh, killing robots? Um, it, a whole new set of discourses and images um, open up to us and uh, we begin to think about this new technology differently. From the perspective of ethics of care, we can think about uh, what is the quality of life like 
in a city where at every moment you can be the target of a killing algorithm. We need to think about that if we push this argument to its logical conclusion. Uh, but instead, the images we, we see with self-driving cars is these kind of images. We are entrapped in these uh, boxes, but apparently we are having a very good time, although this machine has a, has a mind of its own. Um, and we see these types of images, this image of a vehicle that has this sort of uh, control over the environment. We, what we do not see is this kind of image. This is what the car actually sees. This is how it programs, how it uh, you know, uh, categorizes the objects um, in the city based on probability functions that are very similar to the predictive technology that you use when you text. And imagine how many times uh, you get these suggestions that are nonsensical. It's exactly the same technology. Um, so moving on to the question of smart cities, I like to draw attention to similar sense of urgency and reductiveness that's happening in that discourse. Um, so the urgency comes when, you know, three years ago we had, or two years ago we had this um, competition. Oh, all uh, cities, if they want to stay competitive, we need to have smart technologies. We need to instrument our cities with these sensors. And then think about, you know, this image in particular on the left, and uh, this sort of um, omnipresence, um, you know, the centralized control system. Like we have, uh, to paraphrase Haraway, a view from nowhere, uh, looking at the city, controlling the city. Uh, now, we, we never ask what happens if something goes wrong in that centralized system um, and how it affects everyone. And do we, is this really a, image that we want to strive to. Notice the, that in these images there are no people, there is no chaos, and, and the vibrious, vibrancy of the cities are lost. And notice that even when we have people in them, they all kind of look the same, and that's disturbing. Um, so moving on, uh, if you click one level, you see images like this. So we have these lampposts that collect, uh, that suck all this data. Um, so we have an all-knowing data intelligence network. Again, that sense of you know, um, presence. Uh, but then that um, managerial like, um, um, perspective is at the service of a neoliberal agenda uh, to unleash the exponential growth of an app economy. Now, Facebook is uh, uh, in the news a lot these days. And um, gee, I wonder what could go wrong when we have uh, this kind of um, um, you know, these kinds of apps um, in place. Uh, so to conclude as a starting point for conversation, um, I'd like to invite us to think about uh, technology agnostic ways to um, engage with issues as opposed to thinking about what are the powers of the technology and how do those powers um, you know, frame problems, start with issues and problems um, and think about how we frame them before thinking about what uh, uh, technologies might address them. Uh, consider the nuances and long-ranging effects of these technologies. Again, whether it's self-driving cars, whether it's high-definition cameras, what is it like to live in a city that's instrumented in that way? Um, think about terminology. Again, smart cities, uh, it would be interesting to think about it in terms of cybernetics that has a long history and has been critiqued a lot. Um, with uh, machine learning, what about uh, this uh, kind of inscrutable um, uh, uh, categorization uh, system uh, that we are uh, uh, creating? And finally, think beyond uh, values of efficiency and utility and think more creatively about the quality of life in the future of cities. <coughs> Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Andrew Schrock, um, and I am a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Chapman University. Uh, specifically, I look at organizational communication and technology design. And one theme that I thought I would present on, and this is still kind of new, I'm still working on kind of empirical papers and theoretical stuff coming out of this world, is thinking about communication as infrastructure. 
Um, and it's a theme that's come up in my own personal work, kind of on uh, organizations that do technology design that bridges uh, government, nonprofit, and grassroots partners. And then also with my work um, for the postdoc, which is really about um, scientific communities and how decentralized scientific communities um, can uh, accomplish these incredible things like um, mapping the genetic structure of every plant on Earth and uh, mapping the solar system, all sorts of wild stuff. Um, but the theme that sort of kept on coming up is thinking about um, communication as infrastructure. And in particular, I sort of argue that there are kind of a couple different infrastructural traditions out there, one from coming from science and technology studies, uh, another from media studies, and then a third from um, urban studies. Um, so that's the one I'm going to talk the most about um, today to sort of make my point that this is something we need to attend to and really think about communication first when we're thinking about how to um, make uh, uh, bring about justice in a smart city kind of environment because we don't as Nassim uh, mentioned, don't all want to be on autopilot. So we, uh, a lot of the time, talk about kind of communication. Um, and communication, I think, has uh, a strangely intimate but also somewhat distanced relationship with design um, that is really more disciplinary, I think, because there are so many kind of shared concerns. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned infrastructure and sort of those traditions, but, you know, we don't really talk that much about kind of communication as infrastructure, as something that is durable, that's nested, um, and that uh, we can kind of build on when we're thinking about building stronger relationships, particularly um, within, within communities. Um, and the urbanism, urbanism uh, tradition, I think, really comes out of, appropriately enough, um, Chicago School of Sociology, um, people like um, Robert Park, um, William White Street Life Project, um, kind of um, reviving the idea that, um, or reinforcing the idea that kind of public spaces are not spaces uh, where nefarious things happen, but these are really um, uh, so central to uh, community life. Um, and then, of course, also Jane Jacobs. Um, and, you know, I think we're all probably familiar with Jacobs, but um, I think one of the things that I did on my last read through uh, the uh, death and life of great American cities is to think about how she thinks about communication. Um, and I'm really kind of convinced that, you know, she attends so much to things like um, sidewalks and her notion of eyes on the street, because that is a way that you can um, watch out for one another. It's a way that you can encourage kind of horizontal um, uh, surveillance in a positive way. And then there's a, another tradition that you may not kind of be um, uh, know that much about because it's coming from communication. And this is the work of the Metamorphosis Project uh, at USC, where, um, which I was part of for a while. And um, they really took these insights of thinking about um, cities as ecologies and um, went the next logical step, which was to say, well, um, we're still going to be based in neighborhoods. We're still going to be hyper-local. Um, but what they did is they made a um, trilingual website that circulated positive news stories about um, Alhambra in uh, Southern California, which is a neighborhood um, near Los Angeles. Um, and in this way, kind of in very much the same way that, you know, White was looking at how conversations traveled, Jacobs was looking at sort of a lot of the time visual metaphors. Um, this was a way that positive stories could circulate in similar ways uh, in the meeting, as in the meeting and greeting spaces. Um, and then in my own work, kind of looking at um, the civic tech movement, um, I become really kind of attuned to this idea that people can infrastructure. So you can have things like inverse infrastructures that kind of start at the grassroots and then um, there's a meeting place sort of in the middle. Uh, it's more difficult work, but I think it can be done. And it attunes us to kind of the material and political dimensions of infrastructure. Um, so this is Jasmine Latimer uh, on the left, and she's... Um, the social justice and safety lead at Code for America. Um, and she did some work that I thought was really interesting. Um, so there was a um, proposition passed in California. So legally, people were able to have their uh, felony convictions that were nonviolent reclassified as misdemeanors. OK, why does this matter? Well, one reason it matters is because you can get a job. Um, but unfortunately, there wasn't really the kind of clear communication between government and um, the community that there needed to be. Um, so she did kind of, kind of good old-fashioned, I think, um, ethnographic work and then mapping with 
uh, people that were either kind of going through this process. Uh, she shadowed public defenders. Um, and what it came out to at the end of the day, yes, was kind of a website and a mobile app, but I think the important thing to think about kind of infrastructurally is that um, this allowed people to uh, not just have a clearer route through and to make visible kind of the opaque infrastructure of government, but allowed them to communicate with the already existing um, communication infrastructure inside of government. So for instance, a lot of the social knowledge that people needed to tap into actually varied by county. So you couldn't actually create a customized solution that would work anywhere. What you could do is create a, a way of um, integrating into existing communication infrastructure um, that allowed people to um, actually get their records clear, which has, I think we can agree, material and positive impacts on their lives. Um, the final thing I wanted to add is that um, I think about kind of communication infrastructure as um, both embedded within other infrastructure and um, longitudinal. Um, so I just finished the book um, kind of on civic tech. Um, and kind of one of the examples that I use there that I kind of like a lot, and I know some people do um, kind of um, uh, farming and food sustainability, food sustainability issues here, so I thought I'd kind of bring it up. Um, so kind of starting with the post office, um, and kind of I would argue kind of the post office is actually one of, it's now profoundly kind of neglected, but one of our first kind of democratic infrastructures of the country really. Um, and in fact, authors have kind of argued that, um, you know, the ability for mail to circulate and the word to get around was actually a way that uh, kind of the early ideas about what it means for all of us to kind of be a country together um, occurred. So, you know, the post office actually precedes the United States as an entity, right? Um, but then we can think about uh, all the ways that, um, you know, nonprofits and activist groups have kind of use the mail throughout the years. Um, one of my favorites is um, a group called Seed Savers. Um, now Seed Savers is a group that um, preserves our biological heritage. So they archive kind of rare and hard to find seeds. Um, but you know, they, they use kind of the mail for um, this purpose in a really, I think, creative way, um, but also not unusual. You know, there are a lot of newsletters out there. Um, but I think the powerful thing was that they were able to um, mobilize um, nationally and even internationally. So, you know, if you look at the um, Seed Savers reprints, you'll find information about, um, you know, how to care for um, your uh, melon plants, but then also people writing in from uh, the Philippines, West Indies, everywhere in the United States to um, both kind of contribute their seeds and information. Um, and it's thanks to them that I now enjoy, this is my favorite tomato in the whole world. It's a Cherokee purple tomato. Um, doesn't look like much, but trust me, it's very delicious, tangy, slightly smoky. Um, but it wouldn't exist were it not for uh, seed savers uh, in the postal system. Just as an example of sort of how it takes a long time for a lot of these things to get rolling, and I think you can always piggyback on other types of infrastructure. So I think my provocation today is to think about kind of communication infrastructure as a foundation for a lot of the smart cities work in that I think it's something that smart cities is always kind of reaching for to improve participation, uh, to bring about better equity and better relationships with uh, community partners. But don't just think about it as sort of like something you add on at the end. Think about how you can um, tap into existing material and political dimensions of communication that already exist. How communication is already embedded within cultures and communities. Um, and then think about, you know, this is going to be maybe a longer game uh, than a lot of us kind of would ideally like. Um, but these things unfold over time, and it's only by sort of keeping in tune with them that we can understand how to then scale them. So thank you so much. So I'm going to give the next um, mini presentation. And um, I'm really interested in um, making critical futures, and in particular, this concept of the post-human or the more than human in the smart city. And this draws on you know, many um, decades of philosophy and scholarship from a number of fields. But I think one way to think about this, if you go back to Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto, is looking at the ways in which a lot of the categories that have been 
separated for hundreds of years might be actually looked at as hybrids and what holding both of those terms in your head at the same time might mean for the, how you approach design questions and ethical questions and political questions. And so particularly on this list, I would look at the human-non-human -human, um, relations, and this is something that I've written about um, in an article for Design Issues on Design, Decentering the Human in, in the Design of Collaborative Cities, and then more recently trying to look at where some of these concepts are coming from. Um, so when I talk about designing critical futures, I look at the ways in which some of the theory from social science, um, and particularly these critical um, concepts, can be brought into the practice of designing futures. And in terms of theories of the post-human, um, there are you know, many different debates, of course, around these things. So you have um, theories from actor, net, uh, actor network theory from science and technology studies, feminist new materialism, speculative realism, and object-oriented ontology, and non-representational -re geography, and transhumanism. And then you also have really powerful critiques of this concept coming from critical race studies, critical disability studies. I mean, that's something I've written about in a recent article. But I think what engages me around this concept is this idea of using the post-human to move beyond the discrete individual and towards looking at relations between animals and um, technology in particular. So how might we use this concept of the post-human to understand what a chicken wants, for example, or what an algorithm wants? And there's been a really interesting book um, by Joanna um, Zelinska uh, who talks about non-human photography and ways of seeing. Um, and I think it does pick up on you know, the driverless car and the way that these algorithms see the world. Um, and I wanted to apply that to the Red Flex um, camera case here in Chicago in particular. Um, and so here's a sketch from uh, cartoonist for the Chicago Tribune, um, Alan Skillicorn, um, of what this Red Flex tra uh, traffic system is. And those of you who drive here in the city of Chicago or in many other cities around the country where this technology has been deployed might already have a sense of what this technology is and how you as a driver um, interact with it. Um, so here's an image of, you know, sort of the, the fact that uh, a traffic signal might be photo enforced. And here's an example of what kind of a um, summons or ticket you might get from the city if you violate um, those traffic rules. And, and, and I, I will call your attention to the kind of weird blurry images. And I'm noticing this in other parts of everyday life as well from package services that deliver packages to your building and require the same kind of blurry image as verification that that package has been dropped off, right? So often those images actually have pictures of the workers, like the, the laborers, the, the um, postal workers who are dropping off the package because they're required to um, take those images. Um, or even when we look at our own processes for submitting you know, travel reimbursements within large organizations, we also have to take these bizarre photos, which are were not clearly not necessarily humans constructing beautiful images for humans, but some other kind of verification system. And so recently I've written a little bit about um, the Chicago case, um, and I just wanted to take you through some of the, the key learnings around that case. So in, in late July, the city of Chicago agreed to settle a um, $38.75 million class action lawsuit related to the red light camera program. And under this settlement, the city will repay drivers that were unfairly ticketed a portion of the cost of their ticket. And over the past five years, this program, which was ostensibly implemented to make Chicago's intersection safer, it's been mired in corruption, bribery, mismanagement, malfunction, and moral wrongdoing. And this Confluence of factors has resulted in a great deal of negative press about this project, um, but this example should not be understood as an exception. Rather, it is business as usual at the intersection of technology and politics. And according to a study commissioned by the Chicago Tribune um, in 2014, um, in partnership with researchers at the um, University of Texas at Austin, the traffic cameras actually have really very little effect on safeties, and in some cases they've even increased the number of rear-end collisions by 22%. And the rear-end crashes are caused by the fact that people are afraid to drive through the intersections, right? Um, so I even noticed that when driving, riding home from work in a taxi last year, the driver found an alternative route to my building rather than driving through an intersection with red light cameras. Um, and so one uh, city official also made the claim that rather than safety, the red light camera program has always been about revenue generation for the city, 
as a substitute for taxes. So these controversies around red light cameras um, make visible the ways in which these design and engineering criteria, such as safety, efficiency, seamlessness, stickiness, convenience, and security are themselves ways of defining the ethics, values, and politics of our cities and citizens. Um, and I think, like Wolves and Sheep's clothing, that these specifications seem very difficult to argue with at first glance, but once you start looking into the cases, um, you understand the ways in which they are embedded in the political economy, and particularly in neoliberal capitalism, when cities um, have scarce resources and are looking for technology to prove that they can um, gain more, uh, essentially make more money from the implementation of these kinds of technologies. Um, and Redflex, the company that produces these cameras, they also sell other systems for ticketless parking, parking, CCC, TV cameras, intelligent traffic management, and they claim that they are striving to make our cities and our lives more green, safer, and smarter. Um, they argue that their technology can be reliable and consistent and address negative driving behaviors um, and effectively enforce traffic laws. Um, unfortunately, here in Chicago, nothing could be farther from the truth, and instead, the cameras were actually unnecessarily installed in some intersections without a history of problems, they malfunction, they issued illegal tickets due to short uh, yellow lights, which were not within the fed federal limits, and they issued um, tickets after enforcement hours. Um, and we might also argue that due to existing structural inequalities that these um, problems embedded within this technology um, were, are more likely to um, impact poor and less, um, less advantaged citizens. So I tried to kind of summarize some of these key learnings and say, you know, the Red Flex case is really not unique. Um, it's easy to point a finger and say, oh, this is corruption, and the city official actually did pocket millions of dollars from Red Flex um, when this contract was um, put in place. But actually, it is a good example of technology as society and how technology is entangled with the world. So um, this means that we can look at, you know, the technical failures, the social implications, the political implementations, the scientific claims, and the economic gains as all part of a better understanding of um, technological systems, in particular um, around smart cities. Um, so I'll just leave that with, there's a few questions for you know, further um, uh, engagement that we might be able to discuss in the Q&A. And I will, um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul Salvo. Good afternoon. Um, so it's delightful to be here. I'm hoping to build upon some of the things that were already said. I want to talk briefly about work that we are doing around the idea of generating diverse uh, smart cities and civic futures. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by that term. So I'm part of a research group at Georgia Tech that for the past several years has been collaborating with a group in the city of Atlanta called Smart ATL. And this is their website. And they pose this question um, that we're hoping to help answer, or at least to provide a research perspective on, which is, what is a Smart ATL? One of the problems with posing this question, and one of the problems with answering it, is that there's a number of answers that are already out in the world today that are fairly dominant and, frankly, somewhat compelling answers. So one set of answers is the answers that we often get from vendors. This is IBM's perspective of what a smart city is, which is a command and control center that's really committed to imbuing computation across an urban space and then collecting it together for uh, data-driven decision making. So this is one answer of what a smart city is. And this is an answer that many mayors and chief information officers and others are hearing and they're hearing it spoken to them in a way that they're used to hearing. They're used to buying large-scale systems. And so when a company like IBM presents this as one answer, right, they do so in a way that makes sense to mayors. This is another answer. This is an answer that you all may be familiar with. Right? This is um, the Array of Things uh, system, which is being developed in town here as part of the Metro Lab network. And this is an engineering answer. Right? This is an answer to what smart cities might look like from an engineering perspective where the question is how do we design and deploy ways of knowing the environment in a distributed way that is robust and high bit and high bandwidth. 
This is also a compelling answer for many mayors and CIOs because it, it comes wrapped up, right? The idea is you don't have to think too much about this. You can buy into the Array of Things network and at some point you'll have between 50 and 250 of these that are deployed around your city and they'll be producing data. And in the arms race version of smart cities where more street lamps makes you a better city, this is also a compelling answer. The question that we're trying to answer though is not what does a smart city look like from a vendor perspective or from an engineering perspective, but what does a smart city look like from the perspective of the residents who actually live there? So through our work, we partner with community organizations and what you see here is an image on the left from one community that we work with um, in Atlanta, English Avenue, community on the right, um, Cabbage Town, two very different neighborhoods, two neighborhoods that are both undergoing different sorts of development, including the implementation of smart technologies. And the question that we're trying to get at with them, the way that we're trying to do this, is we're trying to say, okay, what are we doing as design researchers? What I would argue that we're doing, and we're doing this in a collaborative fashion, is that we're working together to really envision, prototype, and study how technological products and services might be developed to support more diverse communities and to support them in ways that allow them to thrive. And there's really three characteristics that are important to our work. The first, it's empirical. This is, not, um, this is not me as a designer making this up. Right? This is me as a researcher working together with communities to understand what their actual practices are. Second, it's participatory. And in that, it broadens participation in conceptualizing what a smart city is away from just experts, and including just design experts. And finally, it's pluralistic. Right? It's open to unconventional approaches, to trying to envision what else a smart city might be. This idea then gets us to this notion of, of diverse smart cities. And, and, and I'm not going to go into depth on this, but we take that from the work of J.K. Gibbs and Graham, who were um, economic geographers, who posed the question, what else might the economy be? And they pointed out that when we talk about the economy, we actually only tend to talk about one sort of thing. We talk about free markets. But if you look more broadly, the economy is much more diverse. And if you really want to understand what else the economy might be, we have to study and actually come to an appreciation of things like bartering and volunteering and gray market labor and all of these other sorts of things. We're taking that same approach to smart cities. And our interest is then developing tools as designers and design researchers, what we're interested in developing tools that bring people to those conversations. So over the past years, we've developed a series of tools that we have used together with communities to elicit stories from their perspective about what a smart city might be. So here you see a community group engaged in a very kind of familiar design toolkit that's about trying to get people to tell us what they would envision these services to be. And part of the challenge of doing this as designers is to figure out how to scaffold that, because most people don't spend a lot of time talking about sensors and analytics. And so how do you come up with novel and engaging and appropriate ways of bringing more people into that conversation? And what kinds of activities do you do that allow them to produce representations? What we've done with this then is actually something fairly obvious, at least in this part of the project. We produced a series of use cases Use cases are great because actually, like the pitches that are made to <coughs> mayors and CIOs, they also understand use cases. Right? This is a kind of common way in which they're told to think about the future. And what we've really worked on is collaborating with communities to create use cases around different sorts of practices that are not always part of that story. So that as the mayor or the CIO or other people are trying to make decisions about procurement, they are presented with a set of narratives that are distinct from the ones that they often get. And so really what our, what, our, what our motivation is as design researchers is thinking about how do we work together to create new narratives of making and doing in the smart city. We're very familiar with understanding smart cities by those things on the left, right? Sensor networks, big data, autonomous vehicles, machine learning, data-driven government. What we're hoping to do is to try to find ways not to say that's not going to happen, not to ignore that, not to try to say we want to undo that, but rather to say how do we bring that into conversation with a different set of themes. Themes like community economies, informal systems of care, DIY infrastructure, ad hoc civics, 
themes like local data, a term that my colleague uh, Yanni Lukisas is using to have us think about data differently. And what we're trying to do is to use design as a way to not make new technologies, not make new products and services, but, but in fact make these new stories that can be told and circulated to have us think about the smart city differently. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm also very happy to be here this afternoon. So I'm going to switch back and, in some sense, talk about smart cities and a bit more of the, the traditional mode of sensors and data. Um, and I'm going to do that through a project that has been going on for the past several years um, in collaboration with a colleague in civil engineering. And what we're really focused on is trying to understand um, specifically how to make the transportation network in Atlanta more resilient um, by taking a very narrow look at how do we support cycling infrastructure in the city. So I'm a cyclist and when I first moved to Atlanta in 2006, um, it was a dangerous place to ride and very unfriendly to people on two wheels. And now it's, it's, it's changed a lot and part of that is because there's been um, some su substantial investment in physical and built infrastructure in the city. And starting in about 2011, we were a part of that and that we, we helped produce um, a series of technologies that have evolved over time to really help build out a database um, for making these data-driven decisions about how do you build infrastructure specifically to support cycling. So the first piece of this was a, a smartphone app that, that cyclists, specifically commuters, could use to record where they rode. Um, and then those data were, were being folded into a series of ongoing development projects to better understand how to connect the then very sparse network um, of Atlanta cycling infrastructure. And this first piece was really focused on modes of participation in data production. So one, how do we produce data that, that didn't exist before and was not available? Um, recognizing that cycle census taking is an expensive thing to send people out to key intersections and kind of count the number of cyclists that go by. Um, versus being able to see the, the full route and then understand from that some notion of route choice and why people are maybe avoiding or taking different paths um, that might be different from some idea of what the optimal or shortest route would be. And it has since evolved into a more uh, broad mobile platform <laughs> for doing a whole host of other sensing to understand not just where people are going and to kind of guess at why, but to understand what the conditions of that going look like. So in the, the bottom, this is like kind of the current iteration of the other sensors. These are um, things that we strap onto bikes that include um, a suite of sensors to understand road conditions, um, a suite of sensors to understand traffic conditions, and then a suite of sensors to understand environmental conditions. So things like air pollution, um, vibration from the road, proximity of moving objects, both stationary and, and kind of cars passing you. And the idea here around all of this, again, is how do we, how do we try to use data and sensing and specifically sensing that's born of kind of a crowdsourced mode of, of data collection um, to build out a, a much richer understanding of what it's like to cycle in Atlanta with the goal to fundamentally improve you know, both the experience of the cyclist and also the safety of the cyclist. And so really this is this, is this first piece of, of the smart city that I'm looking at is, is what are the different ways that we think about data production. Um, but it also starts to get at, at what are the challenges with data production, because who is doing it, um, why are they doing it. There's a whole stack of assumptions that are, that are kind of baked into the way that we've deployed and built our, our sensing systems. You know, from are you the type of cyclist who wants to um, use an app or strap on an extra 10 pounds of kit to your bike to collect data? Um, it, are you kind of into the, the um, quantified self movement in a way that tracking is okay? Right? And if you start to think more broadly about the demographics of Atlanta and who's participating, and you interrogate our data set in, with you know, any minor scrutiny, you'll recognize that we don't at all represent you know, kind of the diversity of Atlanta. Right? It's mostly white rich guys that like to do this kind of thing, um, and that's not really representative of the city. But what it does do is it starts to let us paint different kinds of pictures of the city. Right? So, these are some of the things that, that have come out recently. So the map in the background is what came from the original app and is a snapshot of, of kind of all the rides that were taken, um, classified by how confident the, the particular rider was. Um, and then the, the two other images here are um, images that came from the newer sensor boxes that we created um, that essentially give higher fidelity 
um, readouts of, of different locations. So this one's showing proximity and, um, the, and labeled objects. So in some sense, very similar to Nassim's view of what is this, the smart car see or the autonomous car see. This is what the smart bike sees, um, right? And then this one is showing uh, different uh, air quality indices as a person rides through the city. So again, these are segments that come from kind of this underlying map, but they provide much more fidelity. And it gives us a way to represent the city differently. Um, and this representation, again, is really important. And I'll flip back for a minute, though, because one of the things that you begin to notice is that there's, there's whole areas here that are not at all present in the data. Um, and so when we think about participation, we think about representation, we have to start asking the question of, of who is participating and what are we representing as we do that. And that's really what, for me, that's what the project is. So my, my colleague, Carrie Watkins, who I work on this with, she's coming from a civil engineering mode of, of research, and she's much more interested in kind of building models that help understand route choice and help understand safety um, criteria. And I'm much more interested in, in the process through which we go to, to collect those data, right? And really putting the focus on how are we collecting the data, um, by whom, right? And who is not participating? And really importantly, why are they not participating? So how do you resist certain kinds of activities in a city if they're being promoted by the participation in data production? So the, the, and the example that I have of this is, is that blank space in the map is a, an area of, of Atlanta um, that is a series of distressed communities. And one of the reasons that, they, that they've talked about not participating in projects like ours is because when they see bike lanes come into their neighborhood, they see that as an early sign of gentrification. And so it's not that they're not cycling. It's not even that they're not using mobile, mobile phones and other kinds of sensing activities in apparatus but they're really concerned about what are the consequences of us doing that, and the only way that they've been able to you know, reason through why, why not to do it is a way to resist this larger effort to, to gentrify and redevelop their neighborhood. And so these are the kinds of questions that I think I'm trying to get at through these very instrumental deployments of technology, so they're, they're looking very much like um, the kinds of smart car, autonomous vehicle situations that Nassim talked about. I think there's a lot of the communication elements Right, th that Andrew talked about, and so it's how do we bring all these things together in a smaller DIY sense, right? So these are things that people can build and put in, on their own materials um, without having to rely on, on the city or some other large institution deploying. Um, so I'll leave these questions as, as a place to depart, and I thank you.